A very warm welcome to you all, ladies and gentlemen. We are here with yet another top quality episode of the Business English Podcast, a sanctuary for all professionals who aspire to achieve new lofty heights in the corporate corridors of the business world through mastering the nuanced yet highly rewarding landscape of Business English. Today's episode not only promises enlightenment, but a healthy dose of entertainment as well. The title? Overheard in. Business English mistakes from around the globe. Intrigued? Well, you should be. I want you to imagine for a moment that you're in a business meeting and someone uses an English phrase so oddly out of context that it steals the spotlight, diverting attention away from the multi-million dollar deal that's currently on the table. Or picture yourself in the middle of an epic international conference and a colleague from another country, bless their cotton socks, uses an English idiom that leaves everyone scratching their heads and reaching for their dictionaries rather than just nodding in agreement. Not that people carry around dictionaries nowadays, I don't think. Today, we're going on a global journey from the boardrooms of Berlin to the networking events of New Delhi to capture and explore the most memorable, often amusing, and occasionally downright confusing mistakes professionals make while using business English. And let me be clear here, we're not here to mock, but to learn. So we'll also be offering correct versions and explanations for each erroneous utterance. I mean, has it ever struck you why your overly indirect British colleagues insist on adjourning a meeting instead of closing it? Or why your American client seems to touch base so frequently? Stick around because we'll be decoding such intricacies and setting the record straight once and for all. It really is going to be an episode full of revelations. And just as a little teaser... I can assure you that even those who consider themselves fluent in business English, I'm looking at you natives and the C2 posse as well, may discover they've been making a faux pas or two along the way. The devil, as they say, is in the details. By the end of this episode, you'll have sharpened your linguistic acumen and, just maybe, saved yourself from a future embarrassing moment. You can thank me later. So, grab a cup of coffee or tea, although you know which one I'll be having, put those Do Not Disturb signs on the door and stretch off. This is one episode you won't want to pause, let alone skip. Okay, let's dive in, shall we? Drop the beat. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Business English Podcast. Helping professionals communicate more effectively, more confidently and with impact. With your host, Rob, from Energetic English. Let's get down to business. So, here we are. Our first port of call on this global journey of erroneous communication is actually going to be the world of emails and written communication. I know what you're thinking. I thought we were here for verbal fluency and repeat after me's, but... Might I remind you that this is an incredibly vital component to your professional communication. After all, we all know how crucial it is to get this right. Your words are literally documented. And just before we begin, I hasten to add that the nationalities and roles illustrated throughout this episode are in fact fictitious. Fake. A work of fiction. However, the errors highlighted at each stage are very much real and have been documented from real business dialogue from across the world. I will leave a little gap after giving the erroneous statement twice so you can identify the error before I give the correct answer and explanation why. So, with that out of the way, let's jump in. Situation 1. The Japanese executive. Mistake. Dear sir or madam, I am inconvenient to meet tomorrow. Dear sir or madam, I am inconvenient to meet tomorrow. Correction. 
Dear sir or madam, I am unable to meet tomorrow. Dear sir or madam, I am unable to meet tomorrow. Explanation. The word inconvenience suggests that the meeting would be a hassle or troublesome for you, which might come across as unprofessional or insensitive. You're also in the erroneous statement describing yourself as inconvenient, which is certainly not what you want to say at all. The correct term here is unable to meet, which clearly and respectfully conveys that you can't attend the meeting. Situation 2. The Chinese Analyst Mistake Please advice on the following matters. Please advice on the following matters. Correction. Please advise on the following matters. Please advise on the following matters. Explanation. Advice, unvoiced, is a noun, whereas advise is the verb form. In this context, you're asking for guidance, so you should use the verb advise. Situation 3. The Russian accountant. Mistake. We will proceed payment as soon as possible. We will proceed payment as soon as possible. Correction. We will proceed with payment as soon as possible. We will proceed with payment as soon as possible. Explanation. Here, the phrase should be proceed with payment. The word with is essential here for the sentence to be grammatically correct and for the meaning to be clear. Situation 4. The Italian project manager. Mistake. Kindly find attached herewith. Kindly find attached herewith. Correction. Please find attached. Please find attached. Explanation. The phrase kindly find attached herewith is a bit redundant and overly formal. Please find attached is sufficient to indicate that you've included something with the email. Situation 5. The Indian developer. Mistake. Please do the needful. Please do the needful. Correction. Please take the necessary action. Please take the necessary action. Explanation. The phrase do the needful is commonly used in some regions, but can sound vague or unclear to those unfamiliar with the phrase. A more universally understood alternative is please take the necessary action. Situation 6. The Spanish sales executive. Mistake. We can speak in your earliest convenience. We can speak in your earliest convenience. Correction. We can speak at your earliest convenience. We can speak at your earliest convenience. Explanation. The correct preposition to use here is at. So it should be at your earliest convenience indicating you're willing to speak when it's most convenient for the other person. So, if you're drafting an email, make sure you double-check your language. Consider the context, the recipient and the message you're trying to convey. In written communication, every word is an opportunity to project professionalism and competence. Now, yes, of course, there are applications out there that can assist you with this, but I would advise you to do the heavy lifting yourself first before reaching for any assistance. This will help practice and develop that vital business English communication muscle. Not really a thing, but wouldn't it be cool if it was? In our next section, we'll tackle common mistakes made during presentations. So, if you're someone who's often in the spotlight, you won't want to miss this. Let's crack on. Ah, presentations, that double-edged sword of the business world. They can either make you shine like a diamond, or, well, let's not get into the less glamorous outcomes. Now, I hear this one a lot. I don't give presentations in my role. Well, I have some news for you here. As a professional, or anybody else for that matter, as soon as you open your mouth and begin to communicate in verbal or written form, you are presenting in one way or another. Your skills are on show, being presented to the world. 
That is the beauty of it really. You have the chance to develop this skill every time you communicate. So, on that note, let's dive into some of the most frequently encountered business English mistakes that have been made the world over during presentations. Situation 1. The French marketer. Mistake. This product will give a big impact to the audience. This product will give a big impact to the audience. Correction. This product will make a big impact on the audience. This product will make a big impact on the audience. Explanation. In English, it's more appropriate to say that something makes an impact, not gives an impact. And the impact is always on something or someone, not to them. Situation 2. The South Korean strategist. Mistake. We must focus about our objectives. We must focus about our objectives. Correction. We must focus on our objectives. We must focus on our objectives. Explanation. The phrase focus on is the correct term. About doesn't fit here because you're not discussing or talking about objectives. You're concentrating on them. Situation 3. The Swedish designer. Mistake. This interface is more easier to use. This interface is more easier to use. Correction. This interface is easier to use. This interface is easier to use. Explanation. In English, the correct comparative form of easy is easier. There's no need for the word more when using easier. It's redundant and incorrect. Situation 4. The Mexican entrepreneur. Mistake. We have many variety of products. We have many variety of products. Correction. We have a wide variety of products. We have a wide variety of products. Explanation. The word variety is a singular noun that refers to the state of being varied. Therefore, it's incorrect to say many variety. Instead, you can say a wide variety of products. Situation 5. The Egyptian engineer. Now, I am guilty of this one too. Mistake. Let's deep dive into this topic. Let's deep dive into this topic. Correction. Let's delve deep into this topic. Let's delve deep into this topic. Explanation. While deep dive is becoming more popular in business jargon, so we've heard over numerous previous episodes, it can sound a bit buzzwordy or informal. A more traditionally accepted term would be delve deep. Situation 6. The Thai business developer. Mistake. We can lay out on the table all our plans. We can lay out on the table all our plans. Correction. We can lay all our plans out on the table. We can lay all our plans out on the table. Explanation. In English, phrasal verbs like lay out can be tricky, especially when used with other elements like objects and prepositions. Here, the correct phrase is lay all our plans out on the table, which means to present or reveal the plans for discussion or consideration. It's worth noting that some phrasal verbs can be split, and this is what's happening in this case. Now, as we are all very much aware, presentations, or public speaking, better said, is a formidable tool in your business arsenal. And remember what I said earlier, we all do it to some degree all the time. However, much like any tool, its effectiveness lies in the precision of its usage. These are but a few examples, but they underscore a broader point. Language matters. In our next section, we'll delve deep, see what I did there, into the realm of social interactions in the workplace, another vital area where Business English plays a pivotal role, as I am sure you'll agree. Let's keep going.
Now, before jumping into the next section, I wanted to take this opportunity to let you know that if you wanted to get more out of the Business English podcast, then that is possible. For example, full transcripts complete with timestamps so you never miss an expression, phrase-focused one-pages to quickly refresh your memory before that next last-minute meeting, pronunciation support to assist with the trickier elements of business English, live read-along transcripts, quizzes, and much more. If this sounds like it could be useful, then the Business English Podcast premium subscription could be for you. Check out the details at the link in the show notes. Right, on with the show. Now, so far, we've navigated the tricky waters of written communication in emails and the occasional clumsy comments made in presentations. Now let's move to a slightly different setting, social interactions at work. From corridor conversations to lunchtime banter, let's look at how easily mistakes can be made even when we are in a less serious setting. And as I'm sure you'll agree, in many professional business roles, you are never truly off the clock. And the same goes for your communication skills. Let's jump in. Situation 1. The German Engineer. Mistake. I have been working here since three years. I have been working here since three years. Correction. I have been working here for three years. I have been working here for three years. Explanation. When talking about the duration of an activity, the correct preposition is for, not since. Since would be used if you were specifying a starting point, such as, I have been working here since 2020. Situation 2. The Turkish Account Manager. Mistake. I am interested on this project. I am interested on this project. Correction. I'm interested in this project. I'm interested in this project. Explanation. When talking about interest, the correct preposition is in, not on. You're interested in a subject or a project. Situation 3. The Polish Data Analyst. Mistake. Let's discuss about the budget. Let's discuss about the budget. Correction. Let's discuss the budget. Let's discuss the budget. Explanation. In English, discuss doesn't require about. You would simply say, let's discuss the budget. And the meaning is clear without the additional preposition. Situation 4. The South African HR Executive. Mistake. The meeting has been preponed to tomorrow. The meeting has been preponed to tomorrow. Correction. The meeting has been moved forward to tomorrow. The meeting has been moved forward to tomorrow. Explanation. Although the term preponed is used in some varieties of English, it may not be universally understood. The clearer phrase would be moved forward. Situation 5. The Norwegian developer. Mistake. Please revert back to me by end of day. Please revert back to me by end of day. Correction. Please get back to me by the end of the day. Please get back to me by the end of the day. The term revert back is often used in a business context to mean get back. However, revert means to return to a previous state, which isn't the intention here. Use get back to me for clarity. And of course, remember the articles. Situation 6. The Argentinian marketing specialist. Mistake. This campaign didn't came out as expected. This campaign didn't came out as expected. Correction. This campaign didn't come out as expected. 
This campaign didn't come out as expected. Explanation In negative sentences in the past simple tense, the base form of the main verb should be used after didn't. The correct version is didn't come out, not didn't came out. Social interactions in the workplace may seem casual, but as we all know, they can make a significant impression on your colleagues and perhaps more importantly, superiors. As you have seen from bits of this social section, English is a language that thrives on prepositions. They're small but mighty and can completely alter the meaning of your sentences. So always take a second to think before you speak, even in less formal settings. Every interaction is an opportunity to showcase your professionalism and attention to detail. This fine-tuning will honestly pay dividends in the long run, so stay attentive and keep going. In our next section on the worldwide stage of erroneous business communication, we'll switch gears and talk about the language mistakes commonly made during business meetings. This one is a real cornerstone, especially if you're the one often leading the meeting or presenting points. So let's get on with it, shall we? Ah, the conference room. The arena where ideas clash, alliances are formed, and decisions are made. Business meetings are a ubiquitous part of corporate life and, to some of us, an ever-present threat promising to expose our most embarrassing mistakes in the most public of public forums. With the stakes so high, it makes them an indispensable setting to demonstrate your command of business English. So, without any further hype, let's delve into some of the most amusing yet instructive examples of business English mistakes made during meetings from around the globe. Situation 1. The Brazilian team leader. Mistake. Let's finalise this until Friday. Let's finalise this until Friday. Correction. Let's finalise this by Friday. Let's finalise this by Friday. Explanation. The correct preposition is by when indicating a deadline. Until suggests that the activity will be ongoing, which isn't the case here. Situation 2. The Dutch supply chain manager. Mistake. I would like to raise a point about we should reduce costs. I would like to raise a point about we should reduce costs. Correction. I would like to raise a point about reducing costs. I would like to raise a point about reducing costs. Explanation. In this context, about should be followed by a noun or a gerund, as in the ing form of a verb acting as a noun. So it's about reducing costs, not about we should reduce costs. Section 3. The Filipino finance analyst. Mistake. Please explain me the budget. Please explain me the budget. Correction. Please explain the budget to me. Please explain the budget to me. Explanation. In English, when you want someone to explain something to you, the structure is explain something to someone. The to me part is necessary for clarity and correctness. Situation 4. The Israeli product manager. Mistake. This feature is under progress. This feature is under progress. Correction. This feature is in progress. This feature is in progress. Explanation. The correct term is in progress, indicating that work is currently being done on the feature. Under progress is a misunderstanding of the idiom. Situation 5. The Kenyan Communications Specialist. Mistake. As per our last meeting, we are aligned about our goals. 
as per our last meeting, we are aligned about our goals. Correction. As per our last meeting, we are aligned on our goals. As per our last meeting, we are aligned on our goals. Explanation. When you agree with someone about a particular topic, the correct preposition to use is on, not about. So it's aligned on our goals. Situation six, the Greek operations executive. Mistake. If there's nothing else, I will close the meeting now. If there's nothing else, I will close the meeting now. Correction. If there's nothing else, I'd like to adjourn the meeting. If there's nothing else, I'd like to adjourn the meeting. Explanation. Although close the meeting is understood, the more formal and traditional term used to signify the end of a meeting is adjourn. So, as we are all very much aware, business meetings are the pulse of an organisation, a forum where clarity and precision can make all the difference. And this couldn't be truer when considering how we communicate. So remember, small errors in language can sometimes lead to big misunderstandings. And a vital point here, especially when considering meetings, your words reflect not just your ideas, but also your respect for your audience's time and attention. So make it count. In the next and final section of today's episode, we turn our attention to perhaps the most notorious and troublesome element of business communication, a skill that leaves even the most well-versed execs quaking in their boots. But what could it be? Let's find out. So, what is this mystery skill lurking in the dark corner of all business communication skills? It is, of course, networking. That often long, complex and heavily accented dialogue that is so integral to developing and maintaining business that we wouldn't be able to do anything without it. So, in this section, we're going to take a closer look at some of the business English mistakes commonly made during networking events. The art of networking is one of the most crucial skills in the professional arena, a place where first impressions are everything. Let's unpack some of the delightful errors that have been made in various corners of the world when business pros are out there trying to rub shoulders and make connections. Okay, let's go. Situation 1. The Indian Entrepreneur Mistake. I hope this meeting is fruitious. I hope this meeting is fruitious. Correction. I hope this meeting is fruitful. I hope this meeting is fruitful. Explanation. The correct term is fruitful, meaning productive or successful. Fruitious is not a word in English, although it might sound like it should be. Situation 2. The Colombian project manager. Mistake. This event is very much crowded, yes? This event is very much crowded, yes? Correction. This event is very crowded, isn't it? This event is very crowded, isn't it? Explanation. In English, tag questions like isn't it are used to confirm or check information. The phrase very much crowded is also incorrect. The correct form is simply very crowded. Situation 3. The Italian sales director. Mistake. I have many years of experience in sale. I have many years of experience in sale. Correction. I have many years of experience in sales. I have many years of experience in sales. Explanation. The term sales is generally plural when talking about the profession or field of work. In sale would suggest a specific transaction or a discount period. Situation 4. The Chinese financial advisor. Mistake. I am looking forward for our collaboration. I am looking forward for our collaboration. Correction. I am looking forward to our collaboration. 
I'm looking forward to our collaboration. Explanation. The correct phrasing is looking forward to. The preposition to is required to complete this commonly used expression. Situation 5. The Canadian lawyer. Mistake. We should catch up more frequent. We should catch up more frequent. Correction. We should catch up more frequently. We should catch up more frequently. Explanation. When modifying a verb like catch up, an adverb is needed. Therefore, frequent should be frequently. Situation 6. The Japanese researcher. Mistake. Networking is important for job opportunity. Networking is important for job opportunity. Correction. Networking is important for job opportunities. Networking is important for job opportunities. Explanation. The term job opportunities is usually plural when discussing the general benefits of networking. Using it in the singular form may make it sound like you're referring to one specific opportunity. Now, we all know networking events can be a nerve-wracking experience, especially when you're trying to speak a language that isn't your mother tongue. But remember, the aim is not perfection, but simply effective communication. It is worth noting that in the vast majority of situations around the world, your networking partner will also be wrestling with their communication, either because they are also not communicating in their first language, or and they too are frantically looking for points of collaboration in the whirlwind of dialogue. To be clear, this includes natives. The key point is to avoid misunderstandings. As we have seen here today, even if that means keeping the language basic where required. A faux pas, although embarrassing, can always be turned into a learning point, And that's what we've tried to accomplish in today's episode. So, what an adventure it's been, traversing the world's boardrooms, teleconferences and networking events. A considerable repository of mistakes, misunderstandings and, most importantly, opportunities for growth. We've laughed, we've cringed and hopefully, fingers crossed, learnt a thing or two. Remember, each error we commit, whatever it may be, brings us a step closer to mastering the ever-elusive art of business English. Now, did any of these situations resonate with you? Perhaps you've made a similar mistake or heard someone else commit one of these verbal transgressions. If so, great, that's exactly why we're here, to observe, comprehend and internalise these opportunities for growth. As we wrap up this enlightening episode, allow me to leave you with this thought. Mastery of language is not merely a display of intellect, it's an excellent demonstration of your dedication to your professionalism, to clarity and becoming an eternal student. As the saying goes, a smooth sea never made a skilled sailor. So embrace those linguistic waves, however choppy they may be. Now, if today's episode did strike a chord with you, do us a favour and hit that subscribe button, leave a review, and most importantly, share this podcast with anyone in your professional sphere who could do with touching up on their business English. Your feedback and support are the wind beneath our wings. Until next time, have those business cards at the ready, those elevator pitches sharp, and of course, keep it strictly business. You have been listening to the Business English Podcast. Remember to subscribe, leave a review, and we'll see you next time.